You have published memoirs, um, Always Running, and It Calls You Back. You have published a novel, uh, Music of the Mill. You have published uh, uh, poetry, of course, uh, Poems Across the Pavement in 1989, uh, The Concrete River in 91, Troche Moche in 98, you have a volume uh, called uh, with new and selected poems, mm -hmm. uh, My Nature is Hunger. You have also published uh, children's books. Mm -hmm. And one book that is called um, Hearts and Hands, yeah. that I think is about youth building uh, right. peaceful uh, communities. Yeah. Um, in all uh, the books, you create a very cohesive, very accessible uh, universe. Mm. And I think you are one of the few cases where we could say that your work is a fingerprint of your life. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, for somebody who is not familiar with your work, how will you explain or how you will define mm. your uh, literary universe? Well, it's compelling only in the sense that I came from a very um, quiet, voiceless world, you know, um, a world that nobody paid attention to, the Chicano gang um, body experience, which wasn't ever presented in books or in movies or anywhere. And now my voice is very open and strong about this. And I think this is what's helped give uh, people to see something that they wouldn't have seen before. So I feel that all my books and stories are really integral to that life, but also the transformations within that life. And also you present the, this, uh, this life under many different angles because sometimes media or even fiction right. portrays always the same character yeah. uh, and sometimes or many times unfortunately under the, the wrong light. Well, they make caricatures of other people. Uh, I think everybody knows that there's bad and good in everyone. Everybody knows that people make mistakes. And, but when you see movies, um, regardless of whether it's John Wayne or, or you read a book about a person's life, the complexities come out. But when it comes to Chicanos, uh, people of color, poor people, our complexities aren't brought out. You know, it's always like they're in gangs or the worst people in the world, or, you know, there's always yeah. the, the, they make it too simple. And I try to bring in the complexities of a kid that is wound up in that world, but also capable of doing so much more. You were born in uh, El Paso, mm -hmm. Texas, even though your family was not living there. Yeah. And then you have moved a lot. In yeah. one of your memoirs, you say that by the age 18, you have moved 12 times. Yeah. You went from, uh, you went to uh, Watts, yeah, I think when you were two. Different parts of Watts. Yes, then uh, San Gabriel. Uh, exactly. We were in Reseda for a year, and then we went to San Gabriel Valley. And mm -hmm. then I was in, um, mostly in San Gabriel Valley, but different places there, eventually into East LA, in different neighborhoods in East yeah. LA. Yeah. When you were 12, uh, you were experimenting with drugs, mm -hmm. with, uh, with carga heroin. Yeah. And then um, at 16, you were arrested. Yeah. You were placed in a, an adult uh, Yeah, adult facility, facility. murder's role of yeah. the Hollow Justice Jail. Yeah. You described that very vividly, that you were in a cell with two, uh, basically two killers. Yeah, yeah. And they shouldn't have had us there. It didn't matter. That's the way the, our world was. Nobody followed r laws and rules when it came to us. Yeah. I had a cell next to Charles Manson and they were gonna charge us with the murders of three people in the East LA riot, which we didn't have anything to do with, but it doesn't matter. It, yeah. it, it would have happened. But somebody told me the other day that they think that why it didn't happen is because so many Chicano activists had taken pictures and videos oh. and they presented it. And it's mainly cops beating people and the shooting of Ruben Salazar, and I'm not in any of them. <laughs> <laughs> so I think what happened in the middle of the night, they woke me up, I was there, I was kind of lost there for a while. They woke me up and took me out like now that. You, yeah, now you can go, why, what happened, you know? Don't worry about it, no charges, you know? But I think they just couldn't have anything on us anymore, so. You also became involved with the gang Las Lomas, yeah. very, when you were very young. Yeah, 11 years old, wow. and, yeah, and all the way to about 18, 19. And I never got out of Las Lomas, but I got involved in the, trying to bring peace, and that got me in trouble, not with the whole gang. People say, well, the gang must have wanted to get, the, most of the gang was behind me. It was mm -hmm. just two or three guys that weren't for the peace, but also the police. Yeah. That people don't recognize how the police played into the warfare. And I wanted to bring that out in the book. It's hard for people to comprehend, except now we got sheriff's deputies being arrested. Now we got all these police killings in Ferguson, Baltimore, and all mm -hmm. these places. Now people are beginning to see this did happen. <laughs>
In your memoir, It Calls You Back, you say that at 18, you walk into your first poetry reading. Yeah. And that was a very transformative experience. Yeah. I would like you to read that passage sure. from the book. Absolutely. At 18, prior to my last arrest and still drowning in Carga, I walked into my first poetry reading in Berkeley, California. I had an honorable mention in 1973's Quinto Sol Chicano Literary Awards for vignettes for street life I first wrote in jail called Barrio Expressions. I was invited to the award ceremony and given $250, a lot of money for a thief and drug user. Later on stage, I saw Jose Montoya, the godfather of Chicano poetry, David Henderson, one of the country's leading African-American poets, and Pedro Pietri, the neo rican wordmeister. I had never heard poetry read before. I didn't know what poems were, but that day their verses and politics called to me more than music, more than talk, more fevered shapes than sentences, more Che and Malcolm than Shakespeare. I was never the same after this. What really happened in that poetry reading? You know, I think it was a calling deep into my bones. I don't think it's, you know, some people went to poetry reading and didn't get much out of it. They liked it, enjoyed it. Yeah. I felt there was a possibility for me that was different than I'd ever felt. I wanted to be those guys. <laughs> I wanted to do that. It was like, why? I don't know. And maybe I always wanted to do it, and I just never were exposed. Yeah. I wanted to be able to do that and read poetry and, and move people. So not only the writing, but also the, um, the, the, the public aspect of it, the reading, yeah. the, the, the connection. Yeah, of yeah, the, exactly, because yeah, yeah. you're using emotions, feelings, funny, you're funny. You're, you're, it's almost like a stand-up comic, only now the poetry is there and the depth is there. Mm -hmm. And I, I think the other side of it is that, believe it or not, I was still using uh, heroin, mm -hmm. but about a year or two I was done with heroin. I think all those things contributed to help me make a decision that's very hard to do, to leave those kind of drugs, yeah. and to do it without no recovery program, because there wasn't none at the time, to do it on my own. It actually was that kind of um, spark it in, it was in me, an initiatory thing that I want to I wanna do something else. I want to believe in something else. That was the, the birth of you as a poet. Yeah, yeah. But what about the, the birth of you as an activist? Do they go together? It was together? all related. I, I think related. It, was, it was together. Uh, the activism came out of when I got out of the jail, uh, for something I didn't do, but I could see the injustice of it. I got in, uh, active in the Chicano movement. All of a sudden, mm -hmm. I was open. Who are these Chicano revolutionaries? Who are these thinkers? It all came together yeah. for me. So it was, it was all part of what allowed me to leave something so powerful as heroin and the gang life, which is also an addiction. Um, I think one of the major achievements of your poetry is uh, the fact that, that you have uh, given voice to a large group of people, a community yeah. that otherwise will be silenced, yeah. silent and, uh, and invisible. Yeah. But you have very um, uh, memorable characters. Um, let's hear one, um, one of your characters, uh, Tia Chucha. Yeah, yeah. So my Tia Chucha, who was a real person, and she became the basis for Tia Chucha Press. Every few years, Tia Chucha would visit the family in a tornado of song and open us up as if we were an overripe avocado. She was a dumpy, black-haired creature of a people who often came unannounced with a bag of presents, including homemade perfumes and colognes that smelled something like rotting fish on a hot day at the tuna cannery. They said she was crazy. Oh, sure, she once ran out naked to catch the postman with a letter that didn't belong to us. I mean, she had this annoying habit of boarding city buses and singing at the top of her voice. One bus driver even refused to go on until she got off. But crazy? To me, she was the wisp of the wind's freedom. A music maker who once tried to teach me guitar, but ended up singing and singing, me listening and her singing, until I put the instrument down and watched the clock click the lesson time away. I didn't learn guitar, but I learned something about her craving for the new, the unbroken, so she could break it. Periodically, she banished herself from the family and was the better for it. I secretly admired Tia Chucha. She was always quick with a story, another pepito joke, or a handwritten lyric that she would produce regardless of the occasion. She was a despot of desire, uncontainable as a splash of water on a varnish table. I wanted to remove the layers of a natural scene, the way Tia Chucha beheld the world with first eyes like an infant can discern the elixir within milk. 
I wanted to be one of the prizes she stuffed into her rumpled bag. In some of uh, your poems, you code switch between uh, Spanish and English. Yeah, you, yeah. You, you incorporate a lot of Spanish words. Yeah, yeah. Have you written in Spanish? I have, but you know, here's the thing. I can write and read and speak Spanish. Mm -hmm. I have no formal training in it. My parents only spoke Spanish, so they kept it alive for me. And then when I was getting older, I realized, you know what? I'm, I want to dominate English because I want to write in English. But I, I didn't want to forget the Spanish. Yeah. So I, on my own, uh, studied as much as I could. I, I think Spanish is so important, and now I've translated some of my English poetry into Spanish. The other aspect of your poetry that um, I, I, I pay attention to is that um, some words are very frequent. For example, yeah. you have a lot of uh, pain, yeah. hurt, bleeding. Um, for example, in uh, the poem uh, Jesus Saves, you describe yourself as a grieving poet. Yeah. Then, um, also in another poem called uh, Time and Nature, you say, I was a gang son, a drug user, the runaway, the incorrigible. So there's a lot of um, grief and pain. Yeah. And, uh, have you uh, felt um, or, or at any point that this grief was paralyzing? Or in other mm -hmm. words, that the responsibility of responding to the grief was too, too big and, and it was a paralyzing force? I think it always is, and this is why um, poetry is a big move when you have those issues. Uh, any art is a big move, and, and it's like I tell people, make a move. When I try to help people when they're stuck in their grief or their rage, so you got to make a move. And one of the beautiful things about doing it in art, it's one of the biggest moves you can make. Because what happens is you have a pattern in your life that after a while, you sabotage yourself, you diminish yourself, you close off, mm -hmm. you, and then you don't do anything. The, you have to repattern it. And for me, it's very important that I bring that out, that it's just not me being stuck. I have to talk about the grief and the rage. I have both of them, but that I'm not just stuck there. There's a transcendent yeah. part to yeah. everything that happens. Mm -hmm. But I think um, sometimes uh, if a poem is too angry, it mm -hmm. loses the power. Yeah. It's just an angry poem. And in yeah. your case, you get the sadness, you get the struggle, but um, it's almost as if the, the anger becomes transcended or... Yeah. And so I think it's important because poetry even means to shape, to make. And so I was like, okay, so what am I doing? I need to remake <laughs> my life with poetry. Yeah. With the grief, there are uh, two other elements, I think. Mm. One is humor. Yeah. You have a, there's a lot of humor in your poetry. Mm. And some of the titles are very telling. For example, uh, the cockroaches I married, mm. yeah. uh, the rooster who thought it was a dog. Yeah. Um, all, uh, there's one very funny one, uh, A Tale of Los Lobos, yeah. where yeah. you are mistaken. Right. Uh, yeah. So it's... it's um, well, humor to me is, yeah, it's one of these transcendent things. This is why... Uh, even com comedy works because a lot of people are suffering, they're lost, they're confused. They go to a comedy and they, they laugh, it helps. It's cathartic, the whole thing. But for me, it's not just a moment. It has to be a lifelong thing. That if I'm going to see the darkness, I got to see what's good and, and the light and the knowledge within that darkness. You know what I mean? Yeah. If I'm going to live in it, then I got to find all the complexities within it. Because it's not just dark. It's just like light. It's not just totally light. So, yeah, I think it's important that it has to be natural. Then the funny things come because it's naturally funny. And then I got to present it that way. Yeah. And then the other element is tenderness, mm. which I think is a very daring thing to do. Uh, Especially a tough gang man. Yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. exactly. <laughs> well, you know, one thing I learned is to be a man, you have to be a whole man. And most men think it's just having a veneer and you're tough, and, yeah. and that's the weak man, I find. I think a, a whole man is emotionally... Um, Dimension, multi-dimensional, mm -hmm. just like he's uh, artistically multi-dimensional. He's he's also practically multi-dimensional. I think a whole man, just like a whole woman, is a fullness and not just one thing. So I grew up very sensitive kid who was beaten. That was beaten out of you. I had to be this tough gangster guy, and my sensitivity pushed aside. Moment. Yeah. I also think in your uh, in your poetry uh, specifically, I think the tenderness somehow helps the political yeah. activism, yeah, yeah. and the, and also the political activism gives tenderness. But that's um, a good point. It's like Che would say this line about to be a revolutionary, you have to really be in, about love. That throws everybody off, because I think what happens with political people, they become less spectrum too. 
they become this hard nose. Everything's got to be this way, yeah. and nobody wants to talk to them. Like when I ran for governor, I had to do it not as a politician, but I had to use that forum in such a way where I can touch on all these things in a way that was more imaginative, maybe a little bit more inventive, a little bit more poetic. Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. that's what I'm challenging myself and others to do. Let's uh, hear one of your uh, tender poems. It's called uh, Black Mexican. Yeah, yeah. So it's a, a black Mexican, and uh, it has uh, two sayings, two, uh, um, the word, first one is, the worst thing you can do is fall in love with a whore, which people always tell you, but when you're a young kid and you don't have no guidance with love and you meet somebody and she's a prostitute, you don't care. You fall in love with them. That's just the way it happens. And then me, my answer was, but she's a woman. And I think that's what, that's what it was. She's a woman, even if she's a prostitute, you know. The girl appeared through the red haze of stage lights, a black Mexican who told her family in Acapulco she was working in Tijuana cleaning homes when, in fact, she sold herself to sailors and tourists reconquering the people on weekends. She came to me, her small frame leaning against a table, all of 15 years, dark eyes shining through smoke. Or I came to her, a teenage runaway from Lomas, hitchhiking into the void of antiquity, needing more than the empty stares of sunlight in the mirror. Or she came to me, yearning for this dance and the wraith of real love. She walked up with dreams of America and yellow teeth. She came in the caricature of a voice with motherhood acro sliced across her belly and eyes of hiding in mud fields as family sounds closed in on her, carnivorous like dogs, murmuring about how pretty she is, how it doesn't hurt, and the fathers, the uncles, the brothers all slamming into her until she could squeeze into herself and die. Across the way was a hotel of cracked plaster. Its hallways echoed with the shouts of drunken boys, blonde like Ohio, who scraped off the Tijuana women from the shoes of their feet. We crossed the street with the asphalt erupting beneath us and folded into a hotel room. She undressed, revealing the skin of ancient tribes, still fighting, still bleeding. I lay on the bed, told her no, told her yes, told her I had no money. She looked at me as if sorry. We exchanged fingers, then kissed, and I cried, kissed and cried into the moments of my first suckling. <laughs> you created, I believe, uh, 25 years ago in the early 90s, you created uh, the Tia Chucha Press. Yeah. I don't, remember, I don't know the year exactly. It was 90 or 91? 1989. 1989. Yeah. And uh, also uh, is the Tia Chucha Centro Cultural, is that right? Yeah. Like yeah. Tia Chucha Cultural Which Center. It's been around 14 years. Now. 14 years. Yeah. Um, could you talk about these projects? Mm -hmm. How they started, or well, <coughs> the Dear Church of Press came out of the great Chicago poetry scene, which now people know as the Slam. The Slam came out of Chicago. It was born there in around '86, '87. I came to Chicago in '85. I fell in at a really good time. I didn't even know what I was doing. I started <laughs> to hang around these poets. By '88, though, I got active in it. I was just hanging around and watching these slams. I didn't understand it. I, again, it woke me up. Just like. When I was 18, yeah. I, saw, I heard these performed poets. Slamming was competition, and people had to really do good writing, but also good performance, and they competed. And so by 88, I got active, and I started slamming, and I started getting my voice stronger, uh, I, I, how to present myself. And I learned a lot being in that scene. So by 89, pe I wanted to publish my work. Mm -hmm. I didn't mean about other people, but I thought, well, let me start a little press, the Chucha Press, name of my dear. And I was working for the publishing department of the Archdiocese of Chicago. And I had a good friend that worked there, and she designed my book. It was beautiful. It wasn't like these little scrappy little books that people, it was quite beautiful. Uh -huh. I got some money from the city and the state, some grants. We put it out there, and people loved it. It was like, what a great book. And I sold it out of the trunk of my car. That was, that was Poems Across the Payment, my first book. Your first book. But what happened is everybody came up to me, can you do my book, can you do my book? And then I realized, oh, man, I got something here. And I told him, listen, I don't got no money. You know, I said, well, we'll, we'll go get the money. We'll get the grants. We'll find a way. We did. We found a way to pay. And I, I published now maybe close to 70 people, mostly from, I started in Chicago, but then I went national. I published all people, people of color, all races, all ethnicities. Um, it was just going to be about 
powerful language that needed to be brought out to the world. And um, we won awards. We, went, we built ourselves pretty much pretty good way. So when I moved back to L.A. from Chicago and we started the Achuchas, I just uh, had to find a way to incorporate both of them. The press is still there. We have our books out there. But we also have a bookstore of other books and our books. We have a cultural center that does workshops and music, dance, theater, writing, all kinds of arts, murals. And then we have a performance space. So it, it expanded. You are considered um, a major figure in uh, contemporary Chicano literature, mm -hmm. and you have received uh, many awards, mm -hmm. including the Carl Sandberg Award. Mm -hmm. um, and recently, in 2014, uh, or since 2014, you are the Poet Laureate of Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. What does this uh, distinction mean to you? Well, t two things. One, it's good that I've been recognized. It's important because I would do what I do if Nobody ever saw or recognized <laughs> it. You know, it's just something I love. But it is good because you want people to see what you do. You want to see its meaning in relationship to others. Um, you want others to also have connection to, if he did it, maybe I could do it. Maybe my voice could be mm -hmm. heard. My story could be told. So I'm really trying to plant seeds that hopefully can grow on its own. So even as Poet Laureate, it's not just about me. It's about what can I do as Poet Laureate to help other voices come out. I've been doing workshops with kids, small kids to teenagers. I've been talking to adults. I've been going to libraries, uh, museums, schools, uh, festivals since I've been poet laureate, just everywhere reading and talking to people and letting them know that poetry is powerful, story is powerful, language is powerful. And um, that's really my goal. So it's bigger than just me being poet laureate. It's about connecting to all these communities and let poetry become center to our lives again because I think especially in this country it's not that um, it is for kids and it is for slam poets and it is for certain communities but for the most of the country poetry is pushed aside there's no money for it publishing is very small yeah. I want to bring it back to the center of our culture I was thinking about closing with this poem, uh, City okay. of Angels. And then there's another poem that I like called My Name yeah. is Not uh, Rodriguez. Yeah. Yeah, so we you could read that. both of them. City of Angels. Somewhere out there lies the city, bare-breasted, awaiting my return. The city of abandoned nights, of six-year-olds falling through rusted fire escapes, of welfare hotels and facades of disease stoned. The city of grit, wood, and bone. Mm. I step out of a foul-smelling Greyhound bus into the mouth of a moistened dawn, spraying its colors on cardboard condos on the sidewalk. Here I stroll among the walking dead, among the criminalized and displaced, the sun of the desert, our only roof, the song of our whales, the wails of our song, thundering against the sides of the city of angels so far removed from heaven. Uh, and then the other one is uh, uh, on page uh, 105. Yeah. And this is uh, important to point out. This has to do with my, my mother is Raramuri, uh, which in Mexico, they're, the, they're known as the Tarumara, they're the tribe of, of southern Chihuahua. And uh, they're very big and very traditional, and they've stayed very traditional. I like a lot of tribes who have mixed in Mexicanidad. You know, they're, they're kind of, it's been Hispanicized. Uh, they're still very cohesive. Um, among the Tarumara, they split them between the Evangelicos, the Catholicos, and the Gentiles, the Gentiles. Wow. And the Gentiles are the ones that aren't, they don't fall for any of the Christianity. So my mother came from that tribe, but she was Catholicized. So she doesn't know any of her language, traditions, except maybe some of the herbal medicine, because I know she used to use okay. it. Uh, but the one thing she told me was stories. And years later, I went back to Tarumara land. I went down there. I met with people. Uh, they are also one of the few cave dwellers in the world. There's 80,000 of them living in caves in the Sierra Tarumara. And I went there, and they never invite anybody. But when I told them I was looking for my roots, they mm. thought it was beautiful because they said nobody comes back. So, because wow. for them, I was just a Mexican. And they don't come as <laughs> Mexican. So we just like another Mexican. And I said, no, I'm looking for my roots. My mother comes from this tribe. So they opened the doors. So this poem is really about me connecting to that, realizing that Rodriguez has really only got 500 years on this land. Uh, I have a deeper name that I mm -hmm. don't know what it is. It's a native indigenous name that goes mm -hmm. tens of thousands of years back. So the poem, my name's not Rodriguez. My name's not Rodriguez. It is a sigh of climbing feet, 
the lather of gold lust, the slave master's religion, with crippled hands gripping greed's tail. My name's not Rodriguez. It's an Indian mother's noiseless cry, a warrior's saliva on arrow tip, a jaguar's claw, a woman's enticing contours on volcanic rock. My real name's the ash of memory from burnt trees. It's the three-year-old child wandering in the plain and shot by U.S. Calvary in the Sand Creek Massacre. I made Geronimo's yell into the canyons of the old ones. I'm the Comanche scout, the Rada Moody shaman in soiled bandana running in the wretched rain. I'm called Rodriguez and my tears leave rivers of salt. I'm Rodriguez and my skin dries on the bones. I'm Rodriguez and a diseased laughter enters the pores. I'm Rodriguez and my father's insanity blocks every passageway, scorching the walls of every dwelling. My name's not Rodriguez. It's a fiber in the wind. It's what oceans have immersed. It's what's graceful and sublime over the top of peaks, what grows red in desert sands. It's the crony life, the watery breaths between ledges. It's taunt drum and peyote dance. It's the brew from fermented heartaches. Don't call me Rodriguez unless you mean peon and sod carrier, unless you mean slayer of truths and deep sixer of hopes, unless you mean forget and then die. My name's the black hooded nine millimeter wielding child in all our alleys. I'm death row monk, the eight year old gum seller in city bars and taco shops. I'm unlicensed, uninsured, unregulated, and unforgiven. I'm free and therefore hungry. Call me Rodriguez and bleed in shame. Call me Rodriguez and forget my own name. I'm sorry. Call me Rodriguez and forget your own name. Call me Rodriguez and see if I whisper in your ear, mouth stained with bitter wine. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's a very important poem for me.